we're going to start with is the monitor tab. And um, I have to be honest with you guys. Um, I don't know everything about the monitor tab. Um, I just want to be honest. Um, I know what I need to know at this point. And when I do have questions, obviously I go reach out to the developers um, to get the information I need. Um, and also um, that's you know what you guys do as well. So if you've got a ticket, and you're not quite sure, you know why you're getting this error. You know it's a weird, odd error. Um, you create a ticket and you send that information to us. Sometimes we can look at certain things, and that's what I'm going to show you is where you can start looking. But we may not have all the answers, so we reach out to the developers then to get more information from them or have them look at the. Um, information in the monitor tab. Um, so, you know, trying to help them out to give them as much information as we can um, so that they can go in and start debugging the problem. Um, so I'm going to take you through this. There are some things in the monitor tab that you will not need to use. Um, it may be something more for your tech department, or it may be something specific to the SSDT that we just use. Um, so I just want to get you guys familiar with it. If you've never been in there or you've only been in there a couple times, but you're just not even sure what the different tabs are, um, then that's what I'm going to try to do today is, you know, pass that information on to you so you get a bit more comfortable with it. But by no means do I expect you guys to be experts in the monitor tab because I'm not either. Um, so I just kind of wanted to be honest with you about that and uh, how that works. So I'm gonna go to our uh, presentation here. I'm gonna get this started. So hopefully you guys can all see that, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of go back and forth between um, the uh, PowerPoint and then go into a payroll test instance and a USAS test instance. So you can see some of these options. So I'm gonna talk about them a little bit first and then we'll go in and take a look at these. Um, so obviously these are all located underneath the system menu and it's called monitor. And um, you have to have the admin underscore events permission to even see this option. Um, so um, most of the standard um, roles, like the payroll standard role, USAS, the uh, manager roles, do not have this. It's mainly with admin uh, privileges, so it's mainly ITC staff. Um, so that's why, you know, it's obviously underneath the admin role, but it isn't available with those standard roles. And so basically what this um, monitor system basically, it's um, a way for our application to have this built in monitoring statistics, logging levels, there's various logs in there and we'll go through some of that. And it's just useful for you guys, for the SSDT to diagnose potential problems uh, with the application. So there are, um, quite a few things in there that are helpful, especially for our um, developers um, to take a look at things when something just isn't um, looking quite right. Um, if they're trying to post a transaction and they get this odd error and it's in red and they're like, what does this mean? Um, I'm going to take you to that spot where you can start looking for that. Um, so those are the things we're going to cover. So the first tab, when you go into um, monitor, there's a series of tabs that are across the screen. And the first one is the events tab. And the events tab contains a sub menu. Um, and the payroll and the USAS ones look a little different. Um, there's just a couple extra ones in payroll that aren't in USAS. And um, the way that these are displayed is gonna show the last 200 events in the application. Now those 200 events could be within the last five minutes, depending on you know, what was queried or whatever. So, um, so it's going to go in and um, allow them to see specific things. So I have screenshots of both the sub menus for USAS and the one for payroll. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about um, each one of these. 
So the first one, let me back up here. There is a slow metric event in payroll um, that is not in USAS as slow queries and the recent metrics. So there's a few more in payroll that aren't in USAS. Um, so this first one, the slow metric event, what I did is I pulled up a screenshot of um, the actual screen in payroll when you click on slow metric event. And um, it's going to measure the time in milliseconds for an event to start or generate. And so if I created a W-2 report, I went down to the W-2 option and created a report that can be tracked in here. And um, what you're seeing, so let's talk about what you're seeing here. So it creates um, a timestamp, um, the type of metric event, um, who generated it, and this summary information. Um, on a lot of these, uh, event tabs, the highlight view is my friend. Um, it gives me a bit more information, um, kind of, because when I just look at the summary, I doesn't help me a whole lot. But when I click on this record and the highlight view comes up, it helps a little bit more to um, at least determine or easier to read, uh, to see what the event was. Um, because all at this point it's telling me is around this time frame here, which is in military time, um, it's showing me about 319, um, I, a report event started. Um, and so, and then it said that it generated. So it started and then it basically completed. Um, and so if I'm not quite sure what it is, I can kind of read through the summary or I can click on the highlight view to see the information. And what I'm kind of looking at is what was generated what was the W-2 report. Um, so it's this W-2 report definition. So that's where, you know, I'm kind of figuring that it had something to do with the W-2 report was run. Um, so that's basically um, what this option is doing is just measuring those events. Um, and so, you know, I could go down to the next one and it looks like it was a W-2 forms. So yeah, yesterday I was in there playing around with W-2 information and uh, I was clicking on the forms option. I was clicking on the report option. And so it's measuring all of those and, and putting them in here. And like I said, we will go through an instance too after we get through um, these different options, submenus, and then we'll pull up an instance and we'll look at them again. Um, the next one is a recent repository event. And I believe this is a both USAS and payroll. So it's going to include recent database accesses, you know, queries, updates that were made. And so I'm taking the same W2 report example and it's in here as well. And so when I take a look at this, um, I generated that port, like I said, around 318. Let me back up about 319. And so <clears throat> on this recent repository event, again, it's just saying that you queried an event um, and the event was retrieved. And I'm going through, and again, I could click highlight if I wanted to. And what it's doing is it's going down and showing me how long it took to, to do these things. And again, it's in milliseconds. So, you know, one millisecond um, instant, um, but it's going through and telling me everything that it's doing. So I went in and I generated <clears throat> a W2 report. It's doing a lot of stuff. It's going out there and it's pulling in all this information. So you can see these are within seconds of each other. So five, so 320, so these are all pretty much done at the same time. It's going out there and pulling this up to generate this W2 report. And it's going out there and pulling in all of this information. So it's going to the payroll items and it's going in there and pulling up my Medicare, my federal tax, my OSDI, my Ohio state tax, all of that, because that's the stuff that's on that report. So it's going out there and just pulling all of that information in. Um, so that's basically what this is reporting, is that recent repository event. Uh, some other ones that are within that submenu, there is a slow queries event. 
and it determines areas of the application where things may not be running fast enough. Um, and so it's going to go out there and record the timestamp again and what it was doing. Um, and this one, the slow queries, when I look at this, it's about four o'clock in the morning. And when I kind of roll over here to the summary, it says expenditure account. So <clears throat> my guess is this is when I think account sync runs automatically um, between uh, USAS and payroll. Um, I think it runs about four o'clock in the morning. And so that's what it's recording is that um, event that took place. Um, the life cycle event is another one underneath the event tab. And so in this one, life cycles include uh, when modules have been installed, um, model transitions, which I'm not quite sure what this means. Um, if there was a patch applied, that information is recorded on here as well. So that's pulled in to this area. Um, with life cycle, I don't, I've never been in there to, to um, inquire anything. So this isn't one tab that I go to quite often to find out information, not yet anyway. <clears throat> Probably more for the developers. Um, recent audible, auditable events. I believe this is in both USAS and payroll. So these are events that are audited. So we can easily diagnose uh, when a user did um, something. So a module is installed. A period was open or closed. It was loading a rule. So that information is in there. So um, the rules engine, just looking at the timestamp on here, it was at basically um, at midnight. And so the rules engine got reloaded. And so it just, you know, if I wanted to see more again, I could click on my highlight and it's going to pull that information in to let me know. So it, they're auditable events. Um, so that's what that's basically doing. Authentication events. Um, this is probably more for your tech staff. Um, and it usually has to do with um, troubles with um, logging in. Um, mainly um, by looking here, it's basically recording um, their authentication, username and password. And uh, so you can see here when I click on this first one here, um, it's giving me the timestamp, the username and password, um, and just kind of looking at that information, making sure that everything was okay when they logged in. So yesterday, you know, I went in and logged in about that time. So it's looking at the username and password and making sure that um, it was successful. So, um, Sometimes we do inquire about these things on some tickets. Um, if your technical staff wanted more information about troubleshooting authentication events, we do have a link here um, and it's in our, our redesign technical documentation and it goes into further details about troubleshooting that information. Uh, recent metric events. I believe this is the one that's only on payroll. Um, so this measures the time, again, in milliseconds for an event to start or generate. So again, um, generating my W-2 report, it shows me here when it was generated, uh, when it first started, when it was generated. And again, for me to know what it is, I can look over the summary or hit my highlight and it will give me a little bit more information. Okay, so before um, we do anything further here, I'm going to stop this for a minute. And we're going to go in and kind of look at this information. Um, so I'm in a payroll instance. And so I'm going to go back up. And again, I see all the different um, menu options underneath events that we just talked about. And so just going in here, um, so we have slow metric events and recent metric events. And those are the two I started off with this one and ended with this one. So it's, you know, what the software is considering a slower uh, metric event is recorded underneath the slow option. And then any other metric events, which probably going to contain some of the same things is, is found in this one. 
But when I click on the slow metric events, again, um, I generated another W2 report uh, this morning. So it shows my timestamp. Um, and um, again, I can either look through here to kind of figure out um, what it is, you know, or I can use my highlight and it will pull the information up there. Recent repository events. So again, this is keeping track here of recent things that were done on the system. So, you know, I went out and ran that W2 report that goes out and does a lot of different things. So you can see, you know, this is within a second of each other and all the different things that it pulled from that repository event. I can keep scrolling down and of course I ran a W2 report. So there's a lot of things that it's pulling into that W2 report and this is showing where it was pulling from. And again, if I wanted to see more information, I could click on one of these and it brings up a little bit more information. You know, who did it? Um, you know, what was actually done? Um, click on another one of these. This one seems to make a bit more sense to me. Um, so it's, you know, going out there, the report's running, it's retrieving this information to pull it on the report. So here it's going out to payroll items and pulling this information um, at this time and putting it on that report. So lots, you can see there's just so much stuff behind the scenes that's happening just to create a, a simple report in payroll, so, or in USAS. Here's an example again of the slow queries tab. So again, this is, you know, like I said, around that four o'clock in the morning time. And the reason I'm thinking it's account sync is because it says expenditure account repository. And that just kind of made me connect to, well, wait a minute, I think account syncs work around um, start up automatically and, and build at four o'clock in the morning. So that's where that's coming from. my life cycle events. So, you know, just kind of looking at this, um, sometimes I'll take it and I'll flip it and um, flip the timestamp and look to see, okay, what was the very first thing um, recorded in this grid here um, for the day? And it looks like, you know, again, um, at about midnight, um, it went in here and started running this information. So it's just kind of looking through here. Module started events. So these are modules that were, um, must have been restarted. Um, and so it's showing all the different modules that are out there, which these are all, you know, payroll ones. Um, so it's just starting that information up. Recent auditable events. Um, the rules engine was uh, loaded. So again, that's probably back there also in my lifecycle events as well. Authentication. So I went in there today and logged in into this instance at about 8.33 in the morning. So, and again, if I wanna see a little more information on here, I can see what it was going and it was going out there making sure that the username and password um, it was, I was able to successfully log in. So it's recording all that information. And recent metric events. So again, I went in this morning and ran the W2 report and it's showing that report started and generated um, and is telling me what it was. So, the question is, are you guys going to be in here and looking at this information? Maybe, um, maybe not, but um, I wanted to let you know what is in there. So at least it helps you um, to realize, you know, what is, what is an event and what could be showing on these different options underneath events. Um, so, um, you know, if you do get a question about authentication, you know, then, hmm, okay, I remember Michelle saying something about underneath events, there's an authentication uh, menu and um, option, and maybe I need to go in there and check that out and see what's going on. 
or pass that information on to my tech department um, so they can take a look at it. So just things like that, just to get you a bit more comfortable with what you're seeing underneath that events tab. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. So I've got a comment here. I'm in a district that only has four things in the drop down box. Uh, they just went live yesterday. Um, and so it just, I'm not sure exactly, Jen, uh, where in the drop, you know, where you're at, if you're just looking at one of those specific tabs underneath events, um, but it's probably something, you know, fine and normal. So, um, but it's just good to go out there and just familiarize yourself a little bit with it. And, you know, look at that one and then go and look at another district that's been on for a little while and take a look and see what theirs looks like, just to get a bit more comfortable with it. Um, the status tab is the next one underneath monitor, and this contains information about the application's current state. So there is a type here. Um, there's a status, um, which is the current state of the application, and then also is recording um, the modules that were installed. And so you'll see a type underneath their module as well. Um, so it's pulling in whether, you know, has, was the requisition approval module, has that been installed? Um, the value is false, so it hasn't, but the EIS classic integration was installed. So it's just giving you an update or a status of where um, those modules um, are, where they're at um, for this uh, district. So a lot of this stuff is installed automatically when it gets imported in, encumbrance module, that gets installed automatically. So, you know, that should say true. That says false, hmm, um, there might be something going on. Um, so that's why when you import a district, it's just a good thing, um, a good habit to go out there um, when you do your test imports and take a look at the status tab and just review and make sure that everything um, looks good, that there isn't anything that shows failed. Um, or something like that. Um, you want to make sure that things say completed um, or running. Um, so this is just kind of a screenshot of a couple of those things that um, are in here. So here it just talks about the, um, the general ledger. Um, so um, it doesn't say failed or anything. That's good. It says success. So that's telling me that you know your ledgers are set. Um, let's see, the vendor ledger shows that it's completed. Um, the import post-process job, I know that there is a post-process information when I look at the import log, so it shows that that's completed. So as long as you're seeing those type of messages and you see nothing that shows is failed, then you're probably good to go. Um, with that. So it's just a good thing to kind of review this. Um, like I said, once you do a test import and make sure your status tab's looking pretty good. Oh, I'm sorry here. Yes, um, Jen, in regards to that, you said um, you only have four items in the drop dropdown. Um, sorry, yes, um, I had said that at the beginning, but um, um, in USAS, uh, you have just a handful of options underneath events, and then in payroll, you have a few more. So that there is a difference between the two. So um, what I was showing you was payrolls um, event menu, and so USAS will have less. So I'm going to go into the status tab here. And I think I'll switch over to USAS here, change it up a little bit. And so in here, um, a couple other things to note. So I'm underneath status is um, the application instance, this one right here. Um, 
when you're looking at you know your districts that should say production <laughs> so um, that's probably one of the first things to look at to show that this is in production um, and not some other type of test instance of any kind so um, you just want to make sure that that's showing production um, the model state to um, should always say um, that it's running and then here are just some of the things that happen um, uh, during uh, some of them happen when the information is imported in. In this test account, I believe that this was done back in August. Yes. So here's some information here about when we did the initial import into this test instance. And so um, you're going to see here um, the success of what was um, uh, the status of these and that these were basically initialized. Um, so the activity ledger, um, all this information. Um, so those all show that that all took place when I, when we did the import that day. Um, so these are the different status types. So again, these are things that you just want to make sure that nothing shows has failed. And then we've got module um underneath here and this just talks about the modules that were installed and like i said some of these are installed upon import um, they're um, already enabled and ready to go and installed um, others you know are ones that are optional so like i was talking about on the classic integration if that's something that um, obviously doesn't get um, initialized right away. Um, so you need to go in and actually install the classic integration. And once you do, it changes from a false to a true. So these are just a few of the uh, things that you're going to see here. Um, so some of this stuff, um, I went in pre-encumbrance. Um, so that's one that I um, have not installed, so that's why it's showing as false, because I, I didn't go in and install that module. So just kind of gives you a little, um, I don't know, overview of what has been installed and what isn't. So that's what's showing underneath the status page. Okay, so the next one um is metrics and i'm just going to kind of leave this open here um, so i can flip back and forth easier um, so this is a built-in monitoring uh, system um, and this is really more helpful for your itc uh, tech department um, and it's regarding performance uh, it's rare that we uh, go in here um, the only thing I think might be performance issues if things are slow and we may look at um, the Java heap information if it's in there. Uh, and that's something that we would pass along to the developers to look at um, more thoroughly. But um, that's probably my experience so far in this metrics tab is looking at that information. Um, but it is something that uh, we probably get more tickets from your tech department regarding this, your systems people, and they're the ones that um, are going in here and looking at this information and then creating a ticket uh, regarding questions on this. So Catherine and, and um, developers usually handle those type of questions. Um, there is a using system monitor a section in the documentation. It's a troubleshooting article that talks more about the metrics tab. It talks about the Java heap um, linked to the JVM configuration, all of that. So again, those things for me are a little over my head. So these are things that um, I would definitely discuss with Catherine or to our, our you know, people that are involved in the tech part of it. And um, they're the ones that would look into this a little bit more. Um, I do know just, you know, some of the um, things that the developers have told me is that, you know, the refresh button is um, fine to, I mean, you see this button here, that's refresh, but the force GC um, should not be used, should not be clicked on. And um, I know that they've told me that they're going to eventually remove that. They just haven't obviously had time to do that. So, um, so that's basically what the metrics is, is just kind of monitoring um, the system. 
Um, and uh, like I said, the main thing is usually performance issues where they're going in to look at this tab to see if they can figure out what's going on. And if I would go back And so this is basically <clears throat> um, the metrics in USAS. So um, caching might be another thing. If there is a problem with caching, um, then that might be something they may want to, they look into metrics to see what's going on with that. Logging may not be very helpful for you guys either. This is probably more for our developers, for the SSD developers, when an issue is reported um, and we need to go in and debug the issue. Um, so what you'll see is you'll see a toggle SQL button that can be turned on and off. And this is what our developers use to, de to debug an issue. So that when they want to debug a specific thing, they will click on that to um, get that, um, that information. Um, so um, it's basically what that's doing. Um, there is some information in the technical documentation um, about uh, authentication and authorization document that talks more about logging. Um, so those are things, again, um, that we probably um, use more than you guys do. So it's our way of going in and pulling things in a little bit more le higher level to see what's going on with an issue that um, you guys might be having with that instance. Uh, the application log. Um, this is probably the one that I go into most out of the monitor tab. So it's my go-to uh, when there is an issue um, because it's basically what this is doing is it's um, logging the activity of the application. That's what the application log does. So the highlight view again can be very helpful because it's going to give you more information about what's going on um, in that for that particular record. So sometimes server logs can be cleared when an application instance restarts. So it's nice to have that app log there so you can kind of see what's been going on. Um, there is a refresh button, so that always can be refreshed, um, or you can tab out of it and tab back in. Um, but the auto refresh, we don't recommend checking that um, because it just, you know, it's going to constantly auto refresh and that could slow down performance and things like that. So you would just leave that, you know, the default unchecked, but you can use the refresh button in there. So I'm going to go back to USAS here and look at my app log. And so in here, um, what you're going to see is basically, you know, see the timestamp, what's going on. Um, so um, and obviously everything, again, we're looking at the uh, military time, but I haven't really been in here uh, this morning. And so there's probably not a whole lot of information in here, um, but, you know, it's going through. And if I kind of look you know, at midnight, lots of stuff going on that the system's doing behind the scenes. Um, and so it's just going in and showing me um, what it's tracking, um, the activity that even though a user may not be in there doing this, um, the system's working behind the scenes in doing things and, and running things. So it's just recording that information in here is what it's doing. And so sometimes, you know, if we do get a ticket from you guys and somebody's in there posting something and they do get this crazy error um, when they're trying to post an invoice or something like that, and it's an error that you can't diagnose, um, the first thing that we usually do is go in and we have you look at the app log to see if you can see some type of weird error that maybe may give us more information. So sometimes we'll say, well, could you go into monitor, into app log? And if you know, you know, around the time that that happened, if they just called you five minutes ago and told you that they got this weird error when posting an invoice, then let's go look at the timestamp around that timeframe 
and we can go in and then we can click on this a little bit more. And um, like I said, highlight does really help in a situation like this. And we can go in and take a look and maybe get more information from the message. Some of these messages can be very detailed. Um, so this usually helps us or it helps us relay the information on to the developers if we're not sure what exactly is going on. Um, so usually, you know, when you do get those kind of weird, you know, situations with your districts where they do get weird errors that just aren't user friendly, go into the app log around that time and, you know, copy and paste what you're seeing here and include that on the ticket. Um, that could help us um, to determine a little bit more as to what's going on. You know, a lot of this can be foreign, is foreign to us too. So we pass that information on to the developers and then they look at a little more detail. So um, we got a question here when you guys request the app log from us, do you have a preferred format or um, file size? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. I think, um, yeah, I don't think there's anything. I think, you know, as long as you just, you know, take it and attach it to a ticket that we could pull it up. Um, I don't think it's anything where we require a specific file format for that. So, but, you know, that is, it is my go-to place when I do get a weird error. Um, or you guys create a ticket and say, you know, somebody posted a, something you know yesterday um and they had an error um then you know we usually spin up an instance of their data and this is where we go to and we go you know and you'll see that you know it's going to have you know information from the prior days as well and i will go down to that specific um time on that day and take a look and see what's going on uh, report bundle issues, things like that. We'll, we'll come here, job schedule, scheduler issues. We'll come here sometimes to get some information. So it is, it's just a log of the application and anything that they're doing in the application. So it's kind of like an audits in a grid, maybe a little bit. Um, so um, definitely can go in here and try to figure out what's going on. And obviously, if you guys have more questions, pass that information on to us. Um, I'm skipping over. There's a couple tabs you'll notice I don't have PowerPoints on because you won't need them. And one of them is threads. I believe that was the next one. Yeah, you're not going to really go in there and use this um, much. That's probably more for our staff than yours. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that one. So I'm not even going to cover that. So I'm going to go right over to the admin logs and talk about that. I don't have one on my test instance here. That's the reason why, because it's my test instance. Um, but um, you guys will have these whenever you import a district, you are going to see um, an admin log created. And this is the classic import log. So when you import their information over, it's really creating um, the uh, uh, classic USAS import log or a payroll log. Um, that's the full log. And sometimes we will ask you guys for the full import log. And if you guys attach it to the ticket, things like that, that's fine. But this one is more of the abbreviated version of that full import log and that gets stored underneath the monitor. So um, we do have this as part of the post import procedures to kind of review this to see if you see any funny looking errors. Um, and so we have those common import errors documented um, or we're trying to get them documented. Um, so we've got ones for payroll and we have one for USAS. So, um, so like I said, you know, the import log that you see underneath monitor is the abbreviated version. So that full import log, like I said, we may need that sometimes. So um, we usually will ask you guys to attach that to the ticket so we can pull that information in. And I do have an examples, a couple examples of some import log issues. 
um, just to get you a bit more um, familiar with looking up errors on imports. So I'm going to take you through um, a USAS and a payroll example. Um, so we'll do that in a sec. But one thing I want to tell you too is that we are working on, and this was a good question from an ITC. They were in the middle of importing their district's data, and you know it was taking a couple hours. And you know they can go out there and kind of look where it's currently at, but they're like, I don't know where in the process. I'm at, I don't know how much longer I might have on this import. Do you guys have kind of like an overview of the import process? And so I can see, you know, if I'm at the invoice level right now, you know, how much farther do I have to go? And so what we have done is I know that payroll still working on theirs, but USAS, um, Jody created an actual um, area that discusses the actual import process run. And I'll go to this one here and show this to you. I'm gonna get out of here for a sec. Sorry, my little menu thing is getting in my way. <laughs> and so what she created here is just a to, uh, page to explain the various parts of that import process run and what it's going through in USAS here. So you can see here um, that uh, when you look through here, it goes through um, what exactly is happening during the import process. So once those routines start running, this is the order of how those are getting imported in. So it's going first to organization, then OPUs, then vendors, and then it's just going through here. And then it talks about the post-processing jobs that are happening. And then she also provided a link here about the common import errors. So if you, you know, aren't sure where you're at in the import process, it's still been running and you kind of want to see what's going on. Um, you can look in here to say, you know, this is basically where I'm at right now. And this is how much farther my import has to go. So um, that's something that uh, we just wanted to give you guys like an FYI so that you guys, in case you wanted to know where you're at that's out there. And this is, um, I took bits and pieces of an import log that's uh, underneath monitor, um, just so you can see, and this is an example of a, a, a USAS one, um, some of the things that you're seeing in here um, the current status of it completed. That's a big thing. You want to make sure that should say completed. If it failed, you probably can't even get the instance up and running um, to even look at this. Um, but uh, um, it should definitely say completed as the current status. And that's usually at the top of that import log when you click on it. Um, and then it's going down there and showing you what it did. And, um, you know, it's taking those SWAT extract files and downloading them. And then it's going out there and processing them. Um, and then here are some of the potential errors that were encountered when it was going in and processing those files. So uh, one that's pretty common um, is the vendor information. If it's missing something like the state for some reason, who knows what happened in Classic. Um, so that information's out there. Um, invoice, sp suspicious invoices. Um, that information's in there. And again, we do have that report in um, the balancing um, regarding the carrier encumbrances that may be affected because of these. Um, and you can run that report and it should be able to tell you exactly the purchase orders and invoices involved in that. You'll notice that this just tells you the invoice. Well, that's not very helpful. Um, you need to probably look at the PO that's tied to that invoice by running that report. Um, then it'll be able to give you that information. Um, so a lot of this may show up on the carryover reconciliation uh, uh, report. So um, here's just some other examples, uh, the requisition import. 
Um, so it's just telling you about some things. Um, so that's basically just an example of an admin log. So some of these things, if you look at our common uh, import FAQs, these are on there and explains, do I need to clean this up or not? That information is in our documentation explaining these common import errors and what you need to do with them. Um, so we have some for um, USAS and we also, I created um, a few for AR. They're not in with the common, but I'm not sure if I have a link there, I'll have to provide a link, but um, you can go in and take a look at the AR chapter and the import errors are found in there as well. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of these. I know I'm running over a little bit, sorry, Amanda, um, but I kind of want to show you some of these import errors before we move on to the next tab. We only have a couple tabs left. Um, so like I said, you know, some, you know, we get tickets about my import failed. Um, what do I need to look at? I'm not sure where to start. And so I kind of want to take you through steps that have worked for me. Um, obviously, if there's something where I'm actually going in and looking at, you know, I found where it's at, but I'm not quite sure why, obviously I pass that stuff on to the developers. Um, but there's been a couple tickets within the last week that I thought were good examples. And so I kind of wanted to show those to you. Um, Notepad++ is what I use to open up um, the import logs that I get. And these are the full import logs that we're getting from the ITCs. Notepad++ instead of just Notepad works so much better for me because I can see spacing issues and things like that. Um, so if you don't use Notepad++ to look at your import logs, I would download it um, because for me it is much more helpful because Notepad, some of those spacing issues you can't see as well as you can in Notepad++. So I've got Notepad++ pulled up here and I've got some um, different examples here. And so um, you guys create a ticket and say, you know, my USAS or my payroll, this is a, this is a USAS one, my USAS import failed. Um, and so I don't know where to start looking for that. So the first thing that we ask you guys for is that full import log. Because what I'm doing is I'm just going in and start scrolling through here to find something that looks out of the ordinary. If you guys have found better ways, please, please share with everybody. Um, but uh, what um, I basically do is I get that import log and I start looking. I start scrolling down. I got to pull it up through Notepad++ and I start, you know, just kind of thumbing through here and I'm looking for something that kind of just stands out. This is just informational messages here. But then I've got this illegal argument exception. And right here, it's telling me that there is an issue with the cash account extract. Um, and it's telling me that the line number is 222, the records loaded is 221. So that's telling me that it stopped at record 221, loaded up through there, and it stopped at 222 because of some reason. And so if I kind of keep thumbing through here, I may see that same error again. So I'm kind of thumbing through the import log. And I don't see anything there that looks kind of fishy. And I happen upon it again. Same message, same information here. So my guess is, and like I said, this is a full log. I scroll all the way down. Um, the import exited with code one. Uh, that's probably not a good sign because to me, it doesn't seem like it imported fully. And obviously you created a ticket saying it didn't. So we need to find out where on that cash account extract file, what is causing the issue in classic um, that's causing the import to fail. And so basically the next thing I usually ask you guys for is the um, cash account extract, if you could attach that. And so I do have that one. So, and like I said, it loaded up through 221. So I'm gonna go take a look at this and I'm basically going right down 
to line 221. Sorry. And in here, um, I'm looking at the information here. So, and it may not be line, it might be 220, 221, 222. You know, I'm just kind of looking around to see what's going on here. And so when I look at line 222, because it says it stopped at 221, I'm just kind of looking through and I see, you know, you know, the cash account information looks good, you know, and these are all my, my tabs to tab me to the next um, field, basically. So all these arrows that you're seeing. So I'm just kind of, you know, going left to right to see what's going on here. And um, what just stands out to me is invalid fund type. Um, that's a problem. This should have a valid fund. And I bet that that's the reason why this import failed because it couldn't, it stopped at this point because it couldn't read this invalid fund type. Um, it needs to designate what type is it? Is it a special revenue? Um, so I believe that this is the issue. So the next thing I would do is, you know, respond back to you guys and say, could you go in and uh, look at this particular fund and see what the, if there is a fund type. And if not, um, you'll need to go and enter one in. And that should usually solve the problem. Um, so one other thing that you could do is you could pull this um, import log into um, a CSV into Excel and um, use the wizard just to make breaks at each of these fields. And if I wanted to see, you know, I don't, I can't see invalid fund type anywhere else, but is this the only record that has an invalid fund type? It's kind of hard to see in Notepad++, but if you go into Excel and let it break on each of these fields and then resort it, chances are you're only going to see one fund with an invalid fund type. And that just confirms to me that that's probably the issue. So an easy fix, you go into classic, you add this, you know, you know, obviously you talk to the district. This type of fund is usually a special revenue fund, but you need to confirm that with the district and then they can go in and add the, the uh, fund type and then you can try this again. So, you know, after it's fixed and you go in to um, extract the data before you even import it, I would go out and look at the SWOT extract file and make sure that this now says special revenue instead of invalid fund type. So, um, and if it does, chances are your import's gonna be just fine. So that's one of them. Um, let me look at another one here. I've got another one here. I'm trying to remember what this one was about. Um, so for this one, um, we had a ticket come through, and so their um, USAS import failed as well. So again, I start, I ask for the full file, full import file, and I start, you know, thumbing through here and kind of looking and going down. And basically, I'm looking for those, those stop processes again. And here's another. So on the invoice extract file, it stopped on record 36632. And so it didn't load beyond that. So 366, gotta write this down. It, it stopped on this one. So again, I would ask you guys for that invoice extract file so I could take a look at it and see what could be the reason behind that. So I go over to the, it, the uh, invoice file, I've got that pulled up here. And I'm going to go down to that record. So you might want to close your eyes while I'm skimming down through this. <laughs> Make you dizzy. 36633. And so here is the information. Um, so it said it stopped after 32, and so 33 on did not get loaded. Well, right away, what jumps out to me is why does this section look so different from what's below it and what's above it? Um, and so again, this is where plus Notepad++ plus plus helps me out because I can see the spacing. Here's my IRN, space, purchase order, space, 
invoice number. Where's the invoice number on this? Space item number of the invoice. So right now this is telling me that there is no invoice number tied to this purchase order. And this was back in 2014. So you know this has been complete, you know, um, completed, been paid, done. And so, you know, I kind of glance through the rest of the rows just to make sure that everything else looks good. And, it, you know, just eyeballing it up, you know, you can tell it's totally out of alignment with everything else. So there's a reason um, that that invoice number is not on here. And so my next question is for you to go in and take a look at this purchase order and query the, the invoices against it. And in this situation, it was a superscript. It was like a two, like a little a superscript two. Who knows how it got in there? Um, but it's causing problems with the import. So that importer, it looks at every little detail. And so with something like this, we would have to go in and make changes to that invoice number. Well, an invoice number is not easily modifiable in Classic. And so usually a data truth procedure will take care of that. Um, and there's a way to do a store and erase command to actually go in to um, change that superscript two or whatever it was, a two or five or something. Um, from a two to what the number should be. Um, looking at this transaction, when I got the classic files, it was a memo transaction. I think it was board paid uh, STRS amounts or something. So um, looking at their other transactions that were board paid STRS, it looked like they always used the date for the invoice number. So that was something to confirm with the district if that's okay. And if so, then we can use data retrieve. And I provided a data retrieve example um, to change that to the correct invoice number. Um, and again, once that's done and you re-extract their SWOT information, you want to go in and take a look at this invoice to make sure uh, this invoice extract file to make sure that this invoice is now in here. Um, and so that's just, you know, a couple of uses examples of what you can look at. Um, I've got a payroll one here too. And so, you know, I was uh, thumbing through uh, the payroll, the full payroll import file that we got. And we were just kind of looking down here. And again, it's the same type of setup um, is what you're seeing on the USAS. Um, it's got a, you know, showing me that it stopped at a certain record number on the dead name file. So it loaded 99 and there was really, you know, it's, it stopped at that point. So again, I would ask for the dead name extract file and then from there, um, take a look and see what's going on with that one. Um, sometimes, you know, I'll just keep, like I said, I keep thumbing through because I just want to make sure that there isn't anything else that looks kind of funny. Or if I'm looking at the dead name extract file and I can't figure out what's going on, I may need to go back into the import log to look a little further to say, you know, is there something else? kind of here. Um, and I see, you know, I could actually do a search on dead name if I wanted to on this file to see if I see it again. And sure enough, I see this right here. Um, that's also the dead name file. And it's giving me a column count mismatch. And I believe we have this documented in the import. And it's saying that um, online number 101, hmm, that sounds familiar. That's what was on that other error. Um, it contains, for that record, contains 52 columns, but the header on this file only contains 51. So I have an extra column in this record that the importer's not liking um, and it's causing it to fail. So the next thing I would do is, you know, ask um, the ITC for that dead name record and so I'm going to go and pull it up here and go down to this line. And in this one, um, it said that, you know, it stopped at 101. So when I take a look at that, I know some of these are so hard to see, but I'm just kind of comparing it to what's above it and below it because I'm thinking that will help me. 
And that's why, again, Notepad++ gives me all of this information here. Here's my next field arrow. And then here is my next field. Why do I have two dots when the rest of these do not? Um, so there is, um, considering this is the extra issue that's causing the problem, that this needs to get cleared out. And so I would, <clears throat> excuse me, have to go into that dead name record in Classic and pull Aflac up and take a look at it to see um, what is causing that. And I did ask Matt about, or Mark about this one, because I wasn't quite sure <clears throat> where that's pulling. And he said, it's the abbreviation field. There must be some kind of hidden character in that field that is causing an extra column on this import record. So he said they just need to clear that out in classic. So you basically can modify, go in there, modify that dead name deduction code and go to that field and hit, you know, your, your asterisk key to clear out that field, whatever is sitting in there. And so after, you know, you save those changes, you do a new extract. First thing I do is go into this dead name record, the SWOT extract file and make sure that that those two little um, decimals are cleared out. So I'm hoping that that was very helpful. Um, just kind of looking at some of those import um, scenarios that uh, we've encountered most of the time for me, when we get those import logs, you know, eight out of the 10 times, it's because it stopped at a record because there's something weird with that record. And you never know what you're gonna get with the classic data. So, you know, just to kind of look for those type of things um, and look for those weird um, errors on the import log, things like this, where you've got these exception areas, looking for a .txt file, one of the swap files to see, you can even do a search on that. Um, and, you know, it'll take you to those areas where, you know, right there, this is pretty self-explanatory. It stopped on record 221. It loaded up to 221 and it didn't move on. So when I pull up that extract file, I've got 500 records. There's a problem. It stopped at 221 and I need to go look and see why it didn't load 222 on. So it completely failed the, the import. Um, so hopefully um, that has helped you guys a little bit just to see that information. Um, I'm going to go back here. And the last thing I just want to touch upon is the server logs. That's one of the last um, tabs there underneath monitor. And it's going to show you some downloadable links to various log files. And you're probably, you know, not quite sure what do all of those log files mean or what do they do? Um, it's usually something we're asking you guys for um, instead of, you know, you guys looking at these. Um, but there are application server logs. Um, and so in USAS, it's called like um, uh, app USAS web Docker current JSON log and then payrolls, the same thing, except it says USPS. Um, other server logs that you're gonna see um, are listed here with what they're for. These are, um, most of these are for Tomcat or Apache. Um, so these are the server logs for those. Um, sometimes we'll ask you um, to send us the server log and we do have an option underneath help and about that um, there is a send server log to SSDT. So that server log is those application server logs that I just talked about these guys. So that's on um, so you can easily send those to us. Um, and then we, you know, for requesting that information, that's where you can go to um, the help menu and automatically send that to us. Okay. Well, now that I've totally boggled your mind <laughs> with um, the uh, monitor um, information, do you guys have any questions about um, that monitor? and the monitor tabs. All right, I don't see any further chat messages. So I think what we'll do um, is we're gonna take a break um, 
Amanda, do you guys want to meet back like about 10, 15? Um, and then uh, Amanda will get started on rules, I believe. Yep, I'm going to go ahead. All right. Well, we're at 1020, so I'm going to go ahead and um, get us started back up here. Um, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is the system rules. And I'm just going to start off with the same disclaimer kind of that Michelle did in that uh, when we talk about rules, um, I can't promise that uh, I can give you every detail about every part of these rules, but there are parts that we can talk about um, in regards to adding some custom rules, at least the basics, and then kind of looking at potentially um, customizing even some on top of that. So I'm going to share what I look at if I'm looking at customizing certain things within these rules, and um, hopefully that can get us started. Um, certainly down the line, um, there'll be more that I think we'll be able to share, um, you know, once we get more advanced with this, but um, sometimes there are things that we'll be able to help you with customizing. Some of this stuff does get a little bit more techy and we'll need to uh, work with the programmers to make more complex rules. And I'm not sure if I'm getting some feedback or it's my headphones, so just a second here. Okay. All right, I think we're good. Sorry about that. Um, so first I just wanna talk about the basics. Um, when we look at the rules grid, so this is gonna be in the system rules uh, area of the software and um, within both USAS and USPS. And a couple of things we can look at is just the general settings. So whether it's bundled, mandatory or enabled. And for this part, I'm just gonna hop right into the software here. I'm going to start in USPS and we'll be going to system rules. Now, this isn't always on the grid by default. Uh, I've added these columns through the more option here so I can see uh, the different um, settings as far as if they are enabled, bundled or mandatory. Um, but when we look at these rules, so if we just kind of open one up here. I'm just going to click to edit so we can see a little bit better. Uh, bundled is this first option. So what that means is, did it come with the software? Uh, is that a rule that um, was in the system automatically from SSDT? The second thing is, is it mandatory? So some of these rules are optional. Um, basically, when uh, we put certain things into the system. If the system requires it, requires that rule, that's something that has to be enabled, then um, that checkbox will be for mandatory and that's not something that you can disable. And then this enabled status down here is uh, what we can use to determine is this rule, uh, should this be turned on basically. So if there's a rule that is not currently enabled but you wanna turn it on, you'd be able to check this and save that rule and that would uh, basically sort of, um, I wanna say activate, but there is another step if we wanna activate. So that would enable it. And then once you enable a rule, uh, the really important thing to remember and something that you have to get used to at first is whenever you enable or disable a rule uh, status, you also have to click this activate button at the top of the grid. So um, anytime you make a change, you'd wanna go ahead and activate it. That'll sort of do a reload. Um, so that puts the rule in, into full effect. Um, and if you forget to activate it, it won't enable the rule right away, but the next time that there's a restart of the instance, then it would um, activate any rules that are set to enabled. Um, now, as far as, um, that enabled status or like the mandatory status. Uh, there are some rules that are bundled but are not mandatory. Um, some of them are enabled by default and some of them are not enabled by default. So that is documented in the wiki as far as which ones are like automatically set to be turned on or which ones are, are not. Um, so we have a full listing in uh, both sides of the wiki there that would show you the default settings.
Um, outside of that, there are some things that we can do with customizing roles. So um, anybody with admin access or with any of these um, specific permissions added, um, they would have the option to customize the roles and that could be just like enabling or disabling um, or there's an option to add additional roles within there. When we're adding roles, uh, there's a couple other sections we saw in there. So we saw um, that there's a name field and then there's also a description field. And the name field is, uh, it must be unique. So if we're gonna add a new rule, we wanna make sure that that isn't exactly the same as another rule that's already in the system. Uh, also with adding a rule, you'd wanna validate first to make sure that there are no errors before you're saving that rule. And um, we are gonna take a look at uh, actually adding a custom rule here. So we'll um, actually see these things in action. And then we talked about once the rule is saved, we wanna also make sure we click that activate option on the rules grid. So um, in the USSR manual, we actually have some custom rules that um, are not bundled, but that you would be able to add in. And so, um, when it comes to the pieces that like we may be able to discuss in detail, we may not, um, when we'll look at actually kind of like customizing one of these and modifying it ourselves, that's where it gets a little bit um, kind of less clear. But this part is the one thing I wanna show you because this absolutely, like we, I can show you the exact process for like, here's how you add the, these rules from the wiki. So let's go ahead and click to open this up. That opens, okay. And so this takes you right to the section within the USSR documentation for custom rules. And um, within here, so I can scroll through and I have an option to require a delivered to address um, when creating a requisition, uh, require a vendor. Most of these have to do with requisitions. And these are things that um, kind of have been requested uh, along the way. And so if it was a custom rule that, um, you know, was requested of our programming team, but it's something that's not necessarily um, like that big or that common um, that it's actually like in the software. What we did instead was documented these here so that you still have access to them if you come across a district that wants something like this. Um, so in order to do this, so what I would do is, um, let me flip back to my PowerPoint to see if I had a specific one. Okay, required the deliver to address is the one that we're going to be looking for. Which I believe was the first one here. Sorry for my scrolling. So here's the rule. I can see that I have um, an example name, a description, and then I have the details of the rule. So the first thing I'm going to do here is just copy all of this. And I would come to my instance, and this is for USAS, so I want to make sure I'm in USAS. And I would go system rules. And once I'm on this grid, I want to just click the create button to create a brand new rule. And everything that I pasted for the rule text goes in this rule text box. I have this enabled um, and then these um, options at the top I can just leave alone because this isn't something that was bundled or mandatory, but I do want to put in the name and description. So pretty much I can just come through and copy and paste this information over here. And here's where the, uh, the name does need to be unique. I'm just going to put in like an example. Um, and I, it has a spot for the um, district name, so I'll put that in here. And then I have requisition delivery address required. Um, this should be good to go. Uh, as far as the name, so the big thing is that it has to be unique from other names, which I'm certain I don't have another one in here that's, that's called this exact thing. Um, I'm not sure on the requirements as far as like spaces or special symbols. 
but all of my other rule names have this kind of format where you know it's got um it starts with org and then it's got you know uh, separated by periods instead of spaces so my recommendation at this point would be just to like stick with the same format you know if it's working for the other ones that's what we have um you know recommended for the names like i would just kind of stick uh with that instead of trying to make a name that you know maybe has spaces or something like that in there and then i'd want to validate this and i get a nice little pop-up that tells me all right that was successful um if there's something that it doesn't like in this rule it definitely would give you an error and then it would give you some details that you could look at um, and sometimes that can help narrow down if there's something that, that's not working properly within your rule. Um, but definitely these ones you're copying from the documentation, you should be um, set to just get this um, validate message. And then we would be able to save this. And click activate. And then usually this takes a minute, so this will um, kind of go through and load, but once that actually uh, completes, then we'd be able to go um, to the requisition. If we left that field blank, then I'd get a pop-up and it would um, give me an error and let me know. So that's kind of the basics. So if anything, um, you know, cause we're gonna kind of jump into the more techie stuff of looking at like, how would we actually maybe customize one of these? Um, and that's where it gets a little bit more, um, <laughs> a little bit more techie. But um, if anything, at least that gives you the tools to be able to say like, you know, these rules are now there and then you can add those pretty easily to your system if you need to. So um, what we're going to look at is maybe customizing some of these rules, uh, some of these pre-made rules to change minor things. So um, I'm going to do it from, I'm going to do an example based on one of these rules from the wiki. But uh, depending on what you're wanting to maybe tweak, it is possible that maybe you could use uh, one of the standard rules that's in the system and then take, and then kind of start with that as a base. Um, at this point, writing a rule from scratch is not something that I would take on, not something I would recommend trying to take on. That's something we would definitely go to the development staff if we needed um, you know, assistance, we can request rules. And then um, that's something that you know, they can work in for the future to be created. But um, being able to potentially customize, if we can do it off of something that we have, that gives us kind of a quicker route to maybe be able to um, add some customization in here. So the one that we're going to look at as an example is prevent a requisition from being created when the attention field is blank. So this is one of the rules that we have in the wiki. Um, and then I have these general steps as far as like, boom, 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 here's what you would do to customize it. But we're gonna go through each one of these with our example. And let me just make sure I have what I need pulled up here. The first thing is Notepad. And you know, I probably should use Notepad++ uh, too. I usually do when looking at the log files like Michelle showed earlier, but um, with uh, something simple like the rule, I think we can just use our standard one. So I'm gonna stick with that for now. And here we go, okay. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is come back to my wiki page where I have the base, uh, like the base rule that I want um, to start with. And um, so here we go. What the attention field is blank. Now, what I think about when I'm grabbing one of these rules, if I'm like, okay, I want to customize this, is these rules are for kind of basic things. So if this is for the requisition attention to, uh, what I'm going to look at here is, let's actually go look at the requisition. So when I'm creating a requisition, the attention to field is here. So it's saying, hey, um, they can't leave this attention field blank. Um, if I'm going to customize this role, I could do it to something else that's on this requisition header. 
So depending on what your need is, then like my goal would be to go see if I have access to a role that um, is similar. So for example, I'm going to say, I want to, I want to make this description in the header be required instead of the attention. So that's what we're going to do for our example. And since that's on the same type of transaction and the same area of the transaction, I think that we'll be successful in using um, this attention rule and then customizing it to our need of the description. So the first thing was to copy the text to a text editor. And that's our notepad. So I went and copied that full text of the rule. Um, I made sure that I grabbed everything. So I do have this little end part down here that I want to make sure um, stays in there. And um, step one, check. The next thing is to make our changes. So um, this is what I was kind of talking about. This must be consistent with the object we selected. And that basically is, um, you know, it's on the requisition header. So what we want to change it to is also on that requisition header. Um, so let's open this back up. Okay. My first uh, line here is the package and um, I could change the information in here. Uh, my interpretation is that this is basically kind of like your, uh, your um, description. Uh, your description header of the rule. So again, I would keep this consistent with this same um, kind of formatting where it doesn't have spaces, it's got the periods. Um, I couldn't tell you the technical definition of exactly what that part does, but um, I, with editing rules and with some um, playing around with it, for lack of a better term, before, um, you know, we can change that to something that's specific to our rule. Dialect, I would leave this alone. Um, and then this import section, also, I would leave this alone. So this part does have something to do with uh, setting up where the rule is looking. So I can see that it's, you know, pulling up a requisition related information. Um, but I think this part is kind of where it gets a little bit more techie. So that's where I'm like, I know this is a rule that already connects to what I want it to connect to. So um, I'm just going to leave that alone. Um, for the purpose of editing this one. And then this, um, this part here, rule. So this is kind of like the header for my specific rule within uh, my, yeah. So <laughs> my specific rule within my rule. Sounds weird. Uh, but this is the header for exactly what's below it. Um, I think I have this noted in the presentation a little bit later, but technically I could have multiple of these sections before this ends. So I could have, you know, multiple related like uh, rules or um, when and then statements within what I'm going to paste in the system as this one system rule. So we're keeping it simple for now. Um, so I hope that's not uh, too confusing, but basically this is the another kind of like title for our role to keep it organized. Um, and and this doesn't actually show anywhere uh, that I'm aware of within the system once you add the rule. So I'm pretty sure this is just for kind of your reference um, within looking at this rule. This next part is the when and then statement. Um, I put a lot of information on this PowerPoint slide, but uh, so that you have it for reference, but let's talk about this uh, kind of within the context of this rule. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Oh, well, actually, I'm sorry, my notepad isn't gonna get bigger. That's a little bit better. Okay, 
So uh, basically there's two parts of this. There's a when statement and a then statement. The when part of this is going to determine when does this rule trigger? What is the event or what is the situation where I want this to trigger? Then is going to determine what happens when that, when that is triggered. So uh, this first part is a create or an update event. Basically, to me, this means that, um, and we know in the context of this rule, we're talking about requisitions. So when a requisition is created or when it's updated, so if it's um, edited or modified, then it's going to um, look at this rule. This second line, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not really sure what this part um, means. So that's something I always leave alone. And then this last part is basically telling me what it's applying to and what the condition is. So in this one, it's requisition. Um, and then it's saying on the requisition, the attention field, if that is null or blank, then that's what's gonna trigger the rule. And some of these symbols and stuff, um, again, this is where like, I don't have all the details, but if you are trying to do something specific, uh, basically what um, has kind of helped me is like looking through different rules. Obviously, um, if there's something specific you're trying to do, we can definitely, um, you know, help you with, you know, if you wanna put in a ticket, that's something we can help you look at. Cause I know I'm not giving you um, like hardcore specifics here. Um, but basically this is a text field. And so uh, I don't want it to be blank. So it's not a number, it's just like a blank. Um, so if I wanna edit this to description, then instead of attention, I'd have to put the field name for description in here. Um, so we'll go look that up in a minute so that we can make sure we get that right. As far as the then um, part of this, so error, is going to indicate that um, if that attention field is null, or if we change that to description, if that is blank, um, when I try to save this transaction, it's going to give me an error. We could also have it do a warning instead. So a warning would allow it to save, an error will not. And then the second part here, it has this K context, um, a comma, and then anything within these quotation marks is what will actually show as the error. This is the wording of the error, and this is what the user will see. So this, I know we can definitely um, change. Must have a valid, let's see. It'd be nice if I spelled it right. Uh, must have a valid description field. Okay. Um, so now for this part. So. Um, this, since it's actually going to look up the specific field in um, the software, I need to make sure I get an accurate property name for this. And um, how I'm going to do this is I'm going to go back to the software. And um, I'm on my requisitions grid still. And basically, um, what I can usually use is sometimes with the more complex fields or embedded fields, it might be different. Um, but since this one's pretty straightforward, we will be able to grab it. Um, it's basically like what I would think of as the field name if you pulled uh, an Excel like field names report. Um, or what I can do is open the advanced query. And if I can find it in here, it's just like when I make a report, um, like if I'm in the report writer and I use this tooltip to hover over. Uh, so if I go to attention, see how I can see that string says attention. So if I go to description, all right, so description is straightforward, lowercase, um, that um, text right before where it says string, that is what I want to use. If I wanted date, you know, I can see that's date. Um, I do want to be careful. I don't know that I can like kind of, you know, drill down into any of these categories for the specific role because I'm on the header. But uh, this is kind of my little trick for how I'd go find this pretty easily.
All right. And so I think we've updated everything that we want to in this rule. Let's hop back to our PowerPoint and see if I have any other notes here. Um, yeah, I know this slide is really busy. I tried to just make sure and put some notes in here so that you have them to refer to um, if you need those. Okay. So we're good on editing. The next step is to paste the rule, including that end line, um, into create a new rule. And this is the part where we're basically going to do uh, just what we did the first time when we were using the pre-made rule. So I'm going back to my system rules. And I'm going to create. And you know, I'm going to kind of Let's make this, let's just go ahead. We'll still do our little copy and paste thing here, but we'll customize it. And then I'm going to go to my notepad. I want to make sure I copy the entire rule, including that end line. Just paste that in there. So just a copy and paste. And before I save this, let's make sure we validate, especially since um, I was changing things. So um, this will let you know that that is successful. And let's see. I think I'm going to try and um, force uh, an error here just so we can see. So I just made this field name incorrect. And when I validate that, um, now I'm getting an error and it's telling me, you know, that's not okay. And it does tell me, so I basically just scrolled halfway down the error here. On these ones, it does seem to give me a good heads up as to what's wrong. So unable to analyze this expression, and this is where my description um, can't be blank. Um, so I could see, all right, that's actually the part of my rule that's an issue. So I can come fix this, validate that, I'm good, and then um, we can save this up and then go ahead and activate that on our grid. So that's a pretty simple change. Those are kind of the ones that I would uh, mostly look to make or recommend, like if you want to play around with this, you know, starting with. Um, if we look through, let me go back to my, my rules documentation. So now that we kind of looked at that layout of those rules, we can look through here and see that we have um, some, you know, some differences on these other custom rules where it gets a little bit more complicated. So this one is a requisition, um, prevent it from being saved or updated when the item descriptions are blank. Uh, so if we see this one, it does go ahead and look at a requisition, but it also has um, another line here where it's able to connect it to the item line specifically. So that's different than the requisition header. And this one has a couple arguments where the description can't be blank um, and, it, and it has to do with the length. So you can kind of see where, you know, depending on what you're, you're trying to do, this may or may not be as simple. Um, is kind of what we, we looked at, but this is kind of to give you a taste. Um, and then let me scroll up here. I need to look at another one of these simple ones. So here's another one. This one is require a vendor. Um, things like vendors, so that's not a straightforward text field like an attention or a description is. Um, instead, you know, this actually pulls a vendor uh, through the list, through our vendor list, because we have that whole page of vendors. So this one has, you know, a little bit different uh, formula that needs to be put in there. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to edit with the rule. Um, if it is something that you want to kind of play with, you know, as long as you are validating first, um, that's a big step. I would obviously recommend uh, maybe giving this a try in a test land. <laughs> Not maybe, I would definitely recommend 
uh, giving these try in a test land before you're just putting custom rules into, um, you know, your live instances. But um, just hopefully this does give you a little bit more, at least um, looking at these and a start on what you might be able to do with the rules. <laughs> so again, yeah, these aren't always straightforward. And yeah, if you definitely, if there's something that is more complex, uh, you know, we can uh, we can assist you with this. The development team, um, they can assist with creating the really complex rules as well. And um, I have listed on here a couple examples, like what we just looked at, where you know different types of fields require the different formatting. And so here it's just kind of a compiled list of some of those examples. Another thing that we saw on the one um, rule that we looked at, so for the requisition line item number, um, what we're looking at here is the then statement. So the then statement helped us define what the error message would be. So we have that it's an error, and then when we have this um, K context and anything in the quotes is what it's going to show for um, the text of uh, what the error is, but this one actually includes some additional um, some additional information and anything that we see here that starts with this dollar sign is actually a field from um, from the software. So what this is what this is basically setting up is that it's going to say uh, requisition item number as text. And then it's going to actually show the item number that the error is happening on. It'll say units, and then it's actually going to include the item units, uh, the item quantity, the price, and the description. And so basically what this is helpful for is this error is customized to say line item one uh, with one unit um, and you know a quantity of two for $50 has no description. And so if they're getting this error on a requisition that has 50 line items, this can direct them to which one. So there are cases where, you know, a more specific error may be helpful. And um, so if you're customizing rules, that is an option. Um, I did mention that you know that the then option could be a warning or an error. And you definitely want to be cautious of keeping the proper formatting and symbols. So when you're customizing these, like I've definitely run into um, working on one of these where I maybe lost like some quotation marks and that can that can throw it off. So if there are certain symbols or formatting like that, um, you know definitely be careful there. You can use the existing system rules to modify. So we looked at the um, example with a rule that was in uh, the wiki, but if there's something that you know maybe exists that is not a mandatory rule and you wanna maybe tweak that and maybe change an error message or something, that is you know something that you could do potentially. And then um, I did also mention the rules can have multiple when and then statements. So let me go look at, I wanted to show an example of this. Oops. Um, so let's go into UCES first. And, sorry, I got out of this. Uh, That's my spot on accident there. Sorry about that. Okay, so it's the invoice items rules. So that's going to be this one here. Now this is a mandatory system rule. So I'm sorry, it's going to be a little bit faint. I can't really see it. But if we're scrolling through here, so see how we have rule Here's the first rule. I have a when statement, I have a then statement, and then um, that one ends. And then I have another rule 
and I have the when, the then, that one ends. I have another rule and then this ends. So um, these are all applicable to, in, uh, to invoices and to like the same um, kind of setup that happens at the top here. So certainly you can't just put like every rule together into one of these, but there are situations where that can happen. Um, or that might be something that you see if you're coming in here and trying to grab a rule. Um, so kind of just want to include that for context. Um, and then the other thing on this slide is in USPS. So I mentioned that um, our context statement uh, or our like then statement could be an error or a warning. Let me narrow this down here. So if I'm in USPS, I can come in here and see that there are two different rules that have to do with social security numbers. Now, um, first I have my enabled column. So is it turned on basically, is it enabled? And this first one is an error, so this is enabled. The second one is a warning, it's not. Both of these are bundled with the software, so they both um, are included for you um, for like any instance, but they're, neither of them are mandatory. Now I'm sure you'd want some sort of checking and not just be able to like duplicate social security numbers, but the reason that neither of them are mandatory is because your district might want to have a warning instead of an error. And that's something that could actually be changed. Um, but just in the context of looking at uh, the setup here, we can see this is the error. So my then statement says error. And let's open both of these. And this is the warning. So I can see here, this says warning. And just to kind of bring this back to our initial, just like updating rules, um, this is something where I have a district that says, you know, I wanna be able to proceed past that. Uh, we could disable this rule, uh, which is the error and enable the warning instead. And if I wanted to do that, then I could save both of these and activate, and then that would change um, from having a warning to an error if someone tries to save you know, an employee record with a duplicate social security number. Amanda, I have a question. Sure. Um, so actually, we had a couple of districts reach out this morning on the USAS side that mm -hmm. um, they are trying to post a negative payable. So I found the rule that allows you, I could enable the, or uh, disable the rule for a negative disbursement so that they could go ahead and post those payables. Um, question one is, is that a fairly new rule that is an error? Um, I guess if we were looking more for a warning message. So question number two then I guess would be, can I go ahead and copy that, that um, rule that's in there now and just change the word from error to uh, warning? Let's look at it. I don't think it's new. I think that is something that was put in place with redesign to not have negative disbursements. If I'm remembering correct, that's kind of off the top of my head. Um, but let's go look. Was it this disbursement with a negative amount? Yes. Okay. okay. Disbursement with a negative amount. Yeah, so this is, so I'm seeing, you know, it's bundled, but it's not mandatory and um, Let's see if we can do this. This might be going, I can't promise that we'll get this on the fly, but we're gonna try it. <laughs> we're gonna at least look at it because some of these end up being more complex. So the first thing I'm doing, so this is one of our system rules. So I'm just basically doing the same thing instead of from the wiki, I'm just copying it right from this page here, right from the pop-up window. So we've got it into our custom editor and Nope, 
I didn't should actually copy, huh? Okay. Disbursement. Um, I think we can change this. It's going to put custom for now. Um, this portion is related to the SSDT rule. So I'm going to remove this. We're going to leave the import section the same. Um, Warn for a disbursement with a negative amount, and then it's just when it's created. Now, this is absolutely something that um, what we're going to do it here, but I'd want to test this, you know, with actually running through the disbursements, so we can um, look at modifying this. We'll see if we can validate it. Um, but if this validates, it's something I can send to you. And then what you'd want to do is bring this into test um, and then run through, actually run through that negative payable process and try and post that and then confirm that that works um, before you actually put it in there live. But let's see, so attempting to create it with a negative amount. So that warning message still looks okay. Make sure that copies. And I can copy the name and stuff from here, but um, I'm gonna change it a little bit. Um, Cause this is kind of the naming convention for the standard SSDT ones. So um, I do know my first rule is that I want that to be unique. So I'm gonna make sure I change that up cause I don't wanna make it the same exact thing as the uh, SSDT rule. Okay, and then this is the part where we cross our fingers and see how it goes. And we do have some kind of warning here. Okay, it doesn't like something about me changing. So it doesn't like the expression changing it to a warning. Um, so I'll have to check on that then. So we definitely have some of these simple rules are uh, able to be warnings or errors, but um, you know, this tells me that maybe not all rules can just be changed to a warning. Uh, the disbursements are quite a bit more complex too than requisition. So I would say um, something like this I would use for uh, probably like requisitions or purchase orders because you're straight out like you're able to just create the transaction. A disbursement's getting created by another transaction. So I'm thinking that maybe that's our issue here. Um, but this does sound like a good situation um, that we could look into. So if you want to put in a ticket about this one, Leah, I'm happy to look into it more. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, but that was kind of nice to be able to look at like how you might try and take a rule. So I know that wasn't successful, but at least that gives us kind of a um, another example of just looking at you know the things that we might update or not update. Um, okay, so let's go to, I think that's about it I have on rules. Okay, so before we move on, I'm gonna look at custom fields next. Is there any other questions that we have about rules? I know that's kind of a lot. Um, you know, with those, but they can be interesting for sure. Okay, not seeing any other questions, so I guess we'll go ahead and move on here. The next section I'm going to talk about is custom fields. So uh, the custom fields, uh, these also can be added by users with admin access. Um, they can be uh, handled with uh, users that have USAS manager access. 
And um, I believe the group manager in USPS as well, which I'm sorry, I have to put in the presentation. <laughs> um, but basically like manager or admin, uh, these are the permissions that would be required. So you could check if you're um, you know, trying to add to a role or you wanna double check a role, this is what it would need to have in order to be able to um, manage these custom fields. Uh, once you add a custom field, it's going to be able to be viewed on the page that you add it to. Uh, you can also view it um, on your grid by using the more option. And it can be used on reports. So in order to create a custom field here, um, again, I sort of have the basic steps laid out. So you would be able to create, choose the type, um, and enter the details to add this field. And we will look at an example. Um, and then I have this kind of broken down to discuss um, the details of each step. I have uh, two examples with different types planned. Um, but let's talk about this just a little bit before I actually jump into the software this time. Um, what the box is going to look like. So once you go to this system custom field definition page, you'll click create and you'll get this pop up that says, um, you know, to choose the type. And within your drop down, you have um, a whole bunch of different options here. The type you can't change later. So you'd have to like when you create the field, you're choosing that off the bat. And then there are other things that you could like customize or edit later. But the type is always going to be something that like once you create that field, um, that stays. If you want a different type, you'd have to create a new field. So it's kind of important to consider this, you know, right off the bat. Um, this determines the formatting and the input that's allowed for that field. So for example, this first one, a Boolean, is basically a checkbox. Is that field going to be a checkbox? A code, you could enter like different um, codes and that could basically end up being like a dropdown. Created dates, created users, those are things that'll update automatically. Um, money, that'll have like a, a uh, dollar symbol. But uh, basically, instead of going through all of these, what I'm going to do is click this link that I put right here, it goes directly to this section of the wiki. And it has more information um, on these custom fields and the full description of each one of these is listed out in this section. So if you are creating these, this is a great place to come uh, before you even start and determine, okay, you know, this is the kind of field that I'm looking for. So this is the type I want to choose. I would say, um, you know, the checkbox, that's probably going to be pretty common. We're going to look at the example of a code. Uh, but even just like a plain text field is if you're just trying to like type anything in, you know, that might be pretty common. Or maybe number. And then um, the next thing that we have to pick, uh, like basically when we start this that we can't change later is what record does this apply to? And basically what that means is what page is this going to apply to? So if you're in USPS, you might be picking, you know, the employee page, or I want this to apply to a payroll item page. Um, basically what, you know, part of the software are you trying to, um, have this field, uh, trying to make this field on. Um, and so you'll have a huge list. I did not put the list here with um, what you have available in USAS or USPS because they are a lot, but here are some just examples uh, within USAS, like it could be a different transaction type um, page that you wanna put it on. And okay, and let's switch over. I'm going to go in USAS again. Um, all of these steps are the same in USPS. Uh, it is still under system and then it's custom field definitions. And once you get in here, um, you're pretty much going to look the same. Really, the difference is the applies to column. Um, 
So if we want to create, let me go ahead. Sorry, I need to move a couple things around here on this page. I'm just going to close USPS so we don't get confused because this is another um, kind of thing that I would use maybe multiple windows for, or multiple tabs rather. So I'm just going to get a second page for USPS pulled up here. So I'm on my custom field page, but let's determine what we want to do first. So for this example, we're going to add a couple of fields to our refund page. Uh, if I come to refunds, Taking a minute this morning, sorry. <laughs> uh, once I'm in here though, I'm just gonna click create to uh, kind of open a new record because when we start looking at some of the details here, I wanna be able to refer to this because I have some uh, control over like where I want my new fields to end up on this page. So I have my general refund information. I have some check information. But let's say, um, especially with you know some of the stuff that was happening recently where districts had to process a lot of refunds for different things, different like extracurricular or class fees or things like that. So um, not sure 100% that they need these fields, but for the purpose of our example, what I'm gonna say is, what if they want to be able to um, mark which of these refunds were for fees and what the fees were for. And then that would give them a way that they could put something on their grid or they could maybe filter this really easy in a report to be able to go through and see all the refunds that were in that category. Now, at this point, you know, uh, this would be something that they probably wanna put in like before they're creating the new refunds uh, to actually be able to populate those fields. But that's what, that's what we're going with for, um, for the purpose of adding these. So I think what I wanna do is put them in here um, and then maybe give them their own section. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm on my system custom fields grid and I'm gonna click to create a new field. So the first one I want to be able to say like, is this a fee, yes or no, um, or like true or false. And for that, I want it to be a checkbox. So I'm just gonna choose a Boolean because that's the checkbox. And applies to records. So when I come in here, I'm looking for refunds because that's the page that I wanted to show on. So refund. And then I just click continue. Once I continue, I get some additional um, options within here. So I can come through and fill these out. I can see what's required by these nice highlighted red boxes. Um, the display name is what is the user gonna see. Uh, this is what's gonna show on the page. This is what I'll show as like the more option. So I'm just gonna put, you know, is that is it four fees? The type I can see I can't change. Uh, the order. So what the order is going to say is uh, when I'm looking, let me just switch back to my record. So when I add this on here, like what order do I want my field to be in? So um, I can see like refund is the first one in order, date, second one in order, refunded to total and down the line. So anything that I want to be at like the start of whatever section I'm making, which we'll talk about the sections in a minute is gonna be number one. Anything that I want at the end would be the highest number. Um, sometimes you might see some of these fields that have an order number that's like 100. And all that means is just like whatever is the highest number is going to be at the end. So uh, that's basically just a way for me to say like, I can add anything in the middle and that one's still gonna be the last one. Um, so for this one, we're adding two fields. I know I want my checkbox to be first, so I'm gonna put this as order number one. It's applying to the refund page, so I already picked that, I can't change it. Um, is this field active? So 
am I going to be able to see this field on the page when I click save? Uh, if I wanted to like later take this field out, I could come in here and uncheck this so that I could remove the field. The next thing is the property name, and this is also required. So the display name is what the user is going to see on the page. The property name is what the system is going to use. So this is basically similar to like when we were looking at the rules and we said, oh yeah, we have to go get like that field name or that, that like tag that the system uses. That's what this property name is. Um, I would say, I think I don't know if it changes it if you start it with a capital, but the way that I always see these is they do not start with capitals um, and they do not have spaces. So I'm just gonna call this fee, let's just call this, yeah, fees and leave it at that. Um, or I can make this like fees, fees property one. Um, you know, whatever you wanted to put in there. But yeah, uh, you can use numbers, um, but I wouldn't put um, any spaces in there. For the group, I'm sorry, I keep having these drop downs on here. <laughs> um, for the group, this is what's going to determine what section that this ends up in. Um, so if I come back, I'm coming back to look at my refund record and you can kind of see with like popping back and forth, this is why kind of helpful to have both uh, windows open at once so that we can, you know, strategically figure out like where we want to put this. Uh, the group is basically what like header do I want it underneath? Uh, I can leave a blank and it would go in the general section. Uh, if I wanted to put uh, that new box under check, I could put check um, and then it would go underneath this header. But what I said was I wanted to have my own section for it, right? So um, if I don't have another section here, I don't have the one that I want yet, all I would need to do in order to create that is give this a name that doesn't already exist. So I'm gonna call my section refund type. And now when I save this up, it'll create that section for me. So this is saved, so go ahead and um, come back to this page. I'm going to refresh the page so that it has time to, um, you know, actually pick that information up. And then we're going to open um, to create a new uh, refund and we should be able to see it in there. Okay, I should have waited. I'm still loading. <laughs> Uh, so while that's loading, let's go back here. So I have this open, um, but now that I do have it, this is going to add uh, my option to my uh, custom fields grid as well. So I'm just going to filter this so now I can see that, you know, that is available on there to look up later. Uh, if I ever, if I ever do want to like disable it um, or change, you know, what the display name is or something like that, move it to a different group, I could do those things. Um, and here is our refund. So I switched back to my refund grid. I had already clicked create preemptively. So it opened one up here for me. And I can see I now have this refund type section and I would be able to check or uncheck that fees box. But that's kind of boring. Let's add um, a code here too so that we can add a little bit more detail and see a different type of field in action. going to go ahead and create a new one. And let's do a code. We're going to also apply this to the refund. And this one I'm going to say fee type. We're going to make this number two because my first one was number one. Um, so this will make sure that it's after it as it displays. And we'll give it a property name. The group, we want this to be in the same group. 
So now that that group exists, all I would need to do is make sure that I type in this group name exactly the same and it'll be able to find it and put it under that same heading. Let me expand this a little bit. Now you'll notice my window looks a little bit different and this can happen based on the type that you chose. And that's why you kind of have to choose the type ahead of time um, because with the codes, what I can do is I can actually predefine codes that the user would be able to select from a drop down list. Uh, so all I do is just click this plus and let's say um, like athletics fees. And I can just kind of, I'm just clicking the plus to get as many as I want here. Drama, um, and maybe that's all I need, so I don't need this extra one there. So um, basically, like this is going to show, uh, you know, the code. It will show the description of my drop down too. I think this is kind of for the purpose of just having, you know, if there's a code that needs to be referred to elsewhere, um, you know, you kind of have both options to have a code in a description but we'll see how this looks once we save it. Uh, so got those added, go ahead, save up. That looks good. And let me go ahead and refresh this here. I'm refreshing it too, because once we look at this, we're gonna look at it um, and see how it shows on the record. But I wanna make sure that we can go um, look at like maybe adding this to the grid or um, see how, you know, it would be available for a report as well once it's populated. Okay. So we'll click to create. So now I have my refund type section. My first thing in order is fees. So I could check if I wanted to say this is a fee and I could come over here and say, all right, that was for art supplies. So then I could enter my refund information and go ahead, save that up. I would enter all the other fields, you know, just as normal, but then afterwards, um, what I could do is come over here, go to this more option. And now that I've added a group, so the group functions as a header on my transaction, um, but it also does give me like a group of uh, fields that I can pull from my more option. So I would be able to go ahead and add those and this will refresh my page for me. So now I have those on my grid and, you know, if I had added these and then issued a bunch of um, refunds out and I just wanted to go ahead and easily see which ones were for the fees, I could just um, boom, put, you know, true on the grid and um, it would filter that right down based on that property for me. are probably all the way over. So see, I have my fee type, my fees, and then my fee type. And of course, these are blank because all of my existing records, like that's not something I filled out on there. Um, but if I were to go look at one of these, actually, I don't think that it's going to be uh, refunds don't give me a lot of editing ability. Um, so it is something that would just be going forward. But if I viewed these, you know, it does actually show that section on, on here. Um, but yeah, I guess as far as like editing for these, um, you wouldn't have that. But uh, some of the other transactions, like I believe that like requisitions or purchase orders, depending on the status there, you may be able to add fields and edit them. Um, certainly if it's something that you're trying to add, uh, I don't know that I would plan to add it for like previous transactions, but that's certainly something that you could look into. Will be a lot of work though, potentially. Um, the other thing I wanted to show is uh, let's open this advanced query again. And 
um, on here. So if I come through here, I do have, look, I have my fee type and my fee property one. So I can see how those, um, the property names that I gave it, these translate to what I'm able to see when I'm looking for this field um, in my uh, advanced query. This is what I would see if I was like making a report. And then when I hover over this, I can see that property name uh, that I gave this in uh, when I was setting up the field. So I guess that's the other thing I should mention. I think when um, we looked at entering this in, I said, you know, start it, don't start it with a capital um, and don't have spaces, but when you do start a new word, you can make that capital. So like this one I did fee and then I capitalized the T for type. And so when it shows in here, it knows that that's a second word. Um, but the, the string that we see on here that just like fee type all together, um, that's something. So if you pull this, like say you pull the report to Excel field names, um, it would include that property name. Um, it may also include, you know, like custom fields dot fee type. Uh, so whatever, you know, when you're pulling um, on Excel, like if you're going to be like loading information in, uh, you want to use that Excel field names to actually get that proper heading, but it will include whatever that property name is. So be aware of that. Let's hop back here because we are a couple pages ahead. Um, so we looked at um, adding, you know, the details here. Okay, and I think that's all I had um, for our example on custom fields. Do we have questions on custom fields? Uh, will the custom fields still be there if we re-import the district? No. Uh, whenever you would re-import the district, it's just going to pull the information um, from classic, custom fields, kind of like custom report definitions. That would be something um, that would get, I believe, would get overwritten. So I would create those like after you're done with their final imports. Any other questions on those? You know, I know we've mentioned some of these on like uh, the beginner trainings. I wanted to try and give, you know, a little bit more of an example where you could look at a couple of different types. I think that there are a lot of, um, you know, potential uses for these, especially since you could, um, you know, use them within the reports, maybe even use them within rules eventually. Uh, so just kind of something I wanted to make sure to cover so that, um, you have that in your mind. So if there's like a need that you're trying to fill, if you're something you're trying to help your district with, you know, that this is an option. If we create a custom field on a requisition, is there any way the field can be seen on the PO? Um, hmm. I would have to look into that, Jake. I think you'd probably have to make the custom field on both. The part I'm unsure of is like how it would carry over the information when it's converted. We'd have to double check on that. Um, but yeah, generally you're making the custom field for like one type of transaction. Uh, but certainly, yeah, you may be able to create like a same custom field for, for both types of transactions. Um, might have to do a bit more research on that though. If you have a specific idea, definitely put in a ticket. That's something that we can uh, investigate a bit further for you. Okay. Alrighty, well, the last thing I have is talking about the advanced query. So the advanced query, and I've looked at a couple, just, I've just kind of pulled it up throughout um, this presentation. Um, originally, when we kind of planned this, I was thinking about maybe going into some more specific examples um, and looking at like how to use it. But um, actually our last training last week with USAS, Pat gave some wonderful examples of using the activity ledger on, uh, or using the advanced query on the activity ledger. So seeing it in action, I would refer you to the recording there. 
Um, what I want to do on this one is just kind of talk about some more of the details of the different like uh, functions. Like we'll look at the buttons, we'll look at um, you know different places, different places you can kind of use it. Um, but as far as specific examples, I would definitely recommend going um, if you missed that training is checking that out. Um, so first, it is basically just a more elaborate search where the users um, is able to select parameters to search on and then they can select an object or I'm sorry, not an object, an operation, uh, kind of like what you would set up with a report filter. Um, so it has more of that, uh, what is it? The configure filters feel instead of kind of putting things in the different boxes across the top of your grid. Uh, basically, the benefit of this is if you're doing something that's a little bit more complicated, sometimes it's nice to be able to enter all of those filters and then execute it all at once instead of, you know, trying to add all of those columns to your grid and then kind of entering each header, waiting for your grid to load. Um, the other thing is that especially when you're working with a grid like on the USAS side, that activity ledger can have a whole bunch of different information to filter on but you might not need to see that information in each column. So, you know, if you're trying to just stick with the normal grid instead of the advanced query, you'd have to use more and add the columns you want to filter on. With advanced query, you don't actually have to add those columns to your grid. So this is available. You would click the advanced query icon on the top of the grid to open it up and it just pops up at the top of the page. And um, so I've got a screenshot here of what it looks like. Your basic controls are along the top here. And you know me, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump in here and we've already got it open on refunds. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, we'll just look at it right from here. So this advanced query uh, button here is what we popped up. And along the top, I have apply query, which once I actually put some um, some different filters in here. Apply query is what's going to make it actually filter my grid below. Clear query, so if I wanted to clear out, if I had things in there and I needed to just start over, I could clear that. And then hide the controls is just gonna make that pop back down. So I just click this to open it up. I don't know what's going on with my refund page today. Oh, there we go. <laughs> just clicking too much, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so it hides it and that's how we open it. Um, the other thing that we can see here is our properties. So, you know, this is kind of what we were using before to go through and, you know, see what the different um, like property names were when we were um, taking a look before. But this works basically the same way as when I'm creating a custom report and I have my properties on the left and then I could go ahead and um, you know, pick what I want to click and drag over to be able to filter on. Now, when we look at those properties when we're actually building a report, one thing that I think I've, um, I usually always make sure to say is that those properties are always dependent on whatever object you're using for the report. So, you know, in the custom report writer, there's like a little box on the top that determines the object. Um, but obviously we don't have that here because we're on a specific grid. So the object is the grid that we're on. So anything that I see in this properties um, window here is specific to what's related to requisitions. Um, sometimes I can connect to you know, different sections so I can see I can go find some vendor information here. But basically these properties are properties related or pulled through this refund object, which that'll come into play when we talk about using the, um, the saved queries, but that's just kind of an important note. So if I want to come in here and actually, you know what, let's switch. I'm going to go ahead and switch to our activity ledger. Pull that up. Because the activity ledger, you know, connects to um, a bunch of our different pages. So, you know, this pulls information from the refunds, purchase orders, receipts, everything in one place. So this advanced query, when we open this up, I can see that there's a whole lot more here than what I was seeing when I was just on the refund um, grid. Um, one thing that I like about using the advanced 
um, query on the activity ledger specifically is that I have some more options with uh, the account code. So like I do have the option to add the full account to my grid, but if I'm trying to filter something down based on account code, I could actually like get the different pieces of the account code uh, to filter on. And I could just double click or drag these over whatever I prefer. Um, let's close this, let's bring like a date over. Um, so I could bring over as many filters as I might want. Um, and then I would be able to go through and say, you know, this the fun equals this. Uh, you know, the function is between. And these filters all work just how the report filters would. Um, I think those are documented on the custom report creator pages in the documentation. Um, so if that's something that um, you're unsure, you know, about the formatting for these, that would be um, so that I would refer there for. Um, and so basically, I'm just kind of plugging in some random examples here, but just so that we could see, you know, the different things here, and then I would apply this. And of course, it's too big. Uh, my advanced query is probably pretty big. And if I don't filter this down enough, yeah, if I don't filter this down enough, I might get an error. So that's what I'm running into here. But, um, and what I would do is I would go through and try and narrow it down a bit more um, if I was actually trying to look something up here. Uh, but generally, when you'd apply, it's just going to go ahead and filter down here. Um, actually, you know what? That's what we should do. Let's put a type on this. I know I said, okay, I'm going to leave it be, but now I want to make it work. <laughs> So the type column is what I'm seeing right here. And um, especially with this advanced query, if uh, since it has all different kinds of transactions, if I am trying to, if I'm trying to filter it down and I don't put in a type, that could be a whole lot of information. So, all right, I just went ahead and put in like a more recent date uh, since I'm doing the entire general fund. Um, but once I actually get parameters that aren't too gigantic, uh, I can go ahead and apply that. And then now I can see that um, any of these transactions that I'm seeing below are now going to be filtered to um, meet my parameters. Uh, so I have a question in the grid. How do we filter for blank fields? So this is a good one. It does depend on the field type. Um, but generally, so I can't promise this will work with every single field because uh, it does kind of depend, but you can use the advanced query there um, for, um, I guess I would say for most situations. And what that's going to be, so I'm just going to pick a random one here, check number and is null. So when we looked at the rules, we were saying, you know, null means blank. So if I were to pick a field I was looking for and put check number is null and then um, apply that and maybe check number might not have actually been the, the best thing. I think I'd need a text field to be honest with you. Um, which trying to find one on the fly from the activity ledger with all these fields probably isn't the best idea. So yeah, don't actually, I don't, I can't promise that I'll actually work with, with check number, but if you have a field, that's generally blank, um, and you're trying to just find the blanks, this is the first thing I would try is filtering with um, using that is null and then applying that. Um, Andrew asked, would that work for dates? So um, we'd wanna find blank fields oh, for like no termination date. Um, I'm not sure. Um, you could try that uh, with the termination date. Honestly, what I what I would do is um, I would 
take my grid and then pull up like, you know, maybe what I'm looking for. And I would, so like, say I have no, see, I have like a couple of these with no vendor number. I would just do uh, this header and I would filter. And if you click it a couple times, then it's gonna do um, like ascending or descending and it'll bring everything to the top um, that'll show you what the blanks are. So that's the trick that I would use for that. That's how you've been doing it. Yeah, I mean, you can give this a try and see if the is null is gonna work on there. Again, it's like, it's weird, it's a field type thing. Um, and I think it might also depend on what grid you're on. So that's why I'm sorry, I can't give you an exam, uh, exact like answer on that. Um, it's certainly worth a try, but I have run into situations where it doesn't always work with the is null, so. Um, okay, the other thing I wanna show is if we wanted to save this query. So say this is something that I'm going to use regularly. So maybe like once a month or once a year, I want to be able to come to this grid um, and be able to query these things so that I can get an updated list. Uh, what I could do is just put this in here. Um, and I could just give it a name and I click Save Query. And then um, what that does is it puts it in my little drop down here. And I can see, you know, there was a couple of other ones that we had in here um, from our previous examples, uh, from that previous training actually. Um, and that'll save it in there. So if I need to come back later and I'm like, oh yeah, those accounts that I looked up last month or those purchase orders from that account, I wanna keep tabs and see where that's at now since the beginning of the fiscal year, um, I could pull this up. I can pull this up and if I wanted to change something, I could. Um, and then I could run it. So even if I may be using something like that as a template, uh, I do have that option. Uh, but that makes it kind of easy. So, you know, maybe it's not something that I want to have a whole like report for. Um, but if you do have users that really like using their grids, you know, if they're not already using the advanced query, like I could see where they're like, okay, I got to plug in the date, I got to plug in the type, I got to plug in this. Um, and this would just make it pretty easy and give them a way to kind of like save it. Um, with those though, uh, because these properties all depend on what page you're on, of course, these saved queries are going to be specific to the page that you save them on. So, um, you know, I have these three saved here, but if I go to the refunds grid, I probably won't be able to just come in here, you know, and search for any of these because some of these fields are not going to be available on my refund grid. Which that that kind of makes sense in the context of the grids, but I feel the need to say that because when we go to this next step, uh, it's going to be uh, especially relevant. Okay. So the last thing here then is those save queries, um, you know, it's convenient to be able to have those when you're looking up on another grid or on like the grid if you come back later. But if they want to take that a step further and then build a report from that, uh, that's an option too. So if I come into the report manager, um, or I could be like straight out a custom report, if I have a report that is built off of that same like object or grid, um, then I would be able to um, use that filter. So actually, you know what, let's go to the custom report creator first. So if I come in here, um, I can see I have activity ledger as a potential object. And um, when I start this report, I could go through, you know, select whatever things I wanted to be on my report. Um, and of course, I don't know why I'm using the biggest one. <laughs> so uh, I have all of these same options. And actually, it's kind of interesting. You can see like, oh, account, that looks familiar. Um, I have the type down here. And so these are kind of the same things that I was seeing on that. Um, advanced query. So I know at first with like getting used to redesign, certainly like as districts are just switching over, you know, when when I was 
in the position of switching districts, like this was not something that we were teaching our, our new users. But definitely once they get comfortable with this report writer, you can kind of see how this would, you know, maybe translate pretty easily to someone feeling comfortable with uh, the advanced query. Um, so anyways, if I was creating a report, I would just be able to drag over, you know, whatever I wanted to show on this report. And then when I come to the configure filters tab, the second tab over, I actually have this option to load saved queries at the bottom. So instead of manually inputting a filter that I might want, the, the different filters, I could actually come in here and just click on one of those um, saved advanced queries and it would just populate my filters of what I you know, would use on that grid. Um, you can save the reports from the grids too. So like if I'm creating a new report, I don't know if that is like necessarily what I would do is come in and start from scratch. Um, but what I can do is if I have existing, um, existing reports that are kind of built from that same area. So like, um, you know, say I have a filter on my refund grid. If I go to a refund report, I could use that. Uh, the activity ledger is used to build the financial detail reports. So um, if I come in here and open a financial detail report, um, I can, I'll show you where I can see that it's built from the activity ledger. Um, but this is going to allow me to even use those on, you know, in, to be able to customize one of these existing SSDT reports. So when I open my financial detail up, I can see my object. It's created from the activity ledger. And when I go to configure filters, if I know that I wanted this to be the same filter as my test search, I could just pull that right from there. And then, you know, maybe save this. And I could save that, I could generate that. Um, again, I kind of added some random filters here, so I don't want to uh, break this, but um, that's just another option that I don't know that, you know, we really talked about a whole lot where uh, you can add these filters, you know, that you created within the advanced query. All right. And that does it. Um, that's all I have with the advanced query as well. Um, do we have any more questions about, you know, back to those custom rules, the custom fields, or anything on that advanced query that we want to talk about before we call it a day? I have a quick question, Amanda. Um, when you guys, um, let's say hypothetically, you add a rule um, that wasn't in there previously, would we, like, how would we know that that's a new rule to look out for? Like, is that going to be in the release notes or where can we find that? Absolutely. It will, it's definitely something that would be in the release notes. So, okay. um, that's the first place that I would look. I would keep an eye there. Uh, let me see, let me pull this back up. So, and that I would say probably if we add a new rule, that is something that would be um, in the highlights. So the release notes are sent to the UCS redesign, but the emails that we send would link right to here. And then just in the summary, I'm sure they would include um, that, unless it's like a really minor rule, um, they'd likely put that in um, the highlights. Generally, we'll mention them on, um, you know, our, our highlight recaps as well. And then the other thing, so I know I'm kind of sticking to UCS documentation here, um, but the section is the same in USPS. Um, if you go to the system rules, and obviously like I know you're probably not gonna come out here you know, just all the time to be checking. So uh, the new ones, keep an eye on the release notes, but we do have the grid. We were in this custom rules section, um, but within here there are you know, updates, we keep this updated when there is a new rule and add, you know, the name and description here. So I know there's a lot of them, but that's just another place where um, they would show. Thank you. No problem.
Oh, okay. So Andrew tried the um, is null option for termination dates and start stop dates in uh, the payroll items and that did work. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. If anybody else is looking to use that. Okay. Well, I'll hang out for another minute in case anyone still has questions, but um, thank you all for attending today. And I know um, we've been doing this for the last couple of weeks. So um, this is going to be recorded. We'll get the recording posted on the training page. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and uh, have a good weekend.